I'm all in favor. I've spent the rest of my life helping people to discover the Montessori method when they want to, but that I really want them to do it the right way. And there's a big, sometimes a, a river to cross when you come to that. Hey everyone, Jess McCarthy here. So who you just heard there is Mrs. Beverly McGee, true OG, old school Montessorian. I mean, she is 94 years old. She's been in this game or Montessori, you know, movement for 60 years. So she began Alexander Montessori in 1963. It was a school she founded with her husband uh, down in Miami, Florida. So, and she's been rocking ever since in that area. Um, she founded or helped to found Montessori Florida Coalition, which is a group of schools, kind of a conglomerate that have come together to help each other uh, down south. A few really high level schools there uh, in that little grouping. She herself, I'm not going to go big into Miss, Mrs. McGee's bio because I'd like you to just hear from her, but she was trained in AMS, so it's American Montessori Society, and now she runs her own training organization. Let me get the name 100% right here. Montessori Teacher Training Institute, MTTI. And then the teachers that graduate from her program actually get the AMS certification themselves. Uh, Mrs. McGee got an award that's uh, it's pretty insane by AMS. It's called Living Legacy. One person gets it a, a year, and it's basically like somebody who's been in this forever and has really contributed a lot to Montessori, to children, really. And she got that back in 1999, which is, which is wild for me because that's when I graduated high school. So again, she's been in this a lot. Um, now, I do want to note on this discussion, you will see or possibly hear from James McGee, which is one of her sons. He's kind of taken over the helm at Alexander Montessori. He's the co-head of school there. Um, he himself, I, I'm not going to get into his bio, but he was trained AMI, so Association Montessori International for the preschool level. And then he went and got AMS training, and that's at the 6 to 12 elementary level. Uh, both of these people are accomplished individuals. This episode is really about Mrs. McGee. I mean, again, 60 years she's coming on uh, strong. It's it's wild. But if you want to learn about either one of them, uh, I will ensure I get a link to on my episode page to where you can find out more about them and Alexander Montessori and maybe even Montessori Florida Coalition and so forth. We've got some fun out here in Florida. Uh, you can find that information, again, at the episode webpage, and that's at MontessoriEducation.com. Um, that's really it for the bio and the info. I want to get to the conversation. Let's go for it. All right. Welcome, Mrs. Mrs. McGee, to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you on today. Thank you very much. I'm honored that you invited me. Yeah. So, I know we, I'll talk maybe a little bit about how I first encountered you or at least um, saw you recently, but I was thinking, okay. you know, you had just said that, I mean, you're 94 years old. You've been in Montessori for some 60 years. I, I like to ask guests, is there an experience that maybe over all of these decades, it kind of pops out to you or you can think of that comes to mind that really captures what Montessori is, or at least what Montessori is for you? Ah, you know that that's a challenging question. Now, now, I think I should mention that I heard a story about a little child whose parents moved away to a new city and they had a new house and the child had a new school. Mother was driving to school one day and she said to the little child, she said, what are you thinking about? And he said, in my old school, in Montessori, I used to think, what am I going to do when I get there? Which lesson am I going to do first? You know, which, which one am I going to choose? And he was happy and excited. But he said, I don't have to think anymore. Because in my new school, the teacher tells me what to do. Yeah, I, I think that pretty clearly describes the feeling that the child gets when they attend a Montessori school. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I really believe that because she's so brilliant, she designed a curriculum that that is, is fascinating every day in every way. And the teacher is a dynamic link between the lessons and the child and, and the door when they walk in. 
And to little children, everything's magic. Every every new day is something exciting. They they yeah. experience new things all the time. And for some people, they forget that little children are not little adults. And they think that they should know something or that they did something wrong or that it was not necessary or it was, you know, bad or something. And when really they just need help, but they're very independent. Montessori says that independence is the strongest urge of man. And mm -hmm. when a child jump up and down and have a maybe a tantrum, that me do it by myself is because I think they're so frustrated inside. They want to do something, but they don't know what it is, and they don't know how to tell us. So it's the most exciting teaching in the world to start with the little ones and keep on going and see them develop as many of my children who come back adults to visit. It's yeah, it's just a wonderful feeling. That's I mean, you know, and I, I saw you speak, I saw you kind of actually share that very story at, you know, when we saw each other at a conference recently in Florida. And I know that there were people I'd met that actually were students of yours and now they're adults, you know, so it's, it's quite an achievement to have that. Um, and so many. Now I'm curious with the story that you told about a young child being able to make choices for herself or himself. And then in traditional right. school or more public school or whatnot that he went to that was non Montessori, it, uh -huh. he doesn't have those choices. So have you seen a lot of children over your years that leave Montessori and they go into the normal system and they're, they're not content with it. They're not happy with it. Have, has that occurred often through your, um, you know, decades in Montessori? Uh, it might've happened, but I can't say that they came back and told me if it did, you know, I really don't yeah. know. I was a public school teacher in the beginning. I taught fifth grade and seventh grade high school and adult education. Mm. And so I really don't want to say anything negative about the public school because I cared about my kids and, yeah. and a lot of teachers love them and, and they put their whole life into their children, the same as Montessori teachers. However, we have an advantage with the Montessori method. We simply have an advantage that nobody else has. And it's a wonderful way of going to work every day. And it's a happy way for children to learn. Yeah. Right. We have to make a distinction because Beverly was also, if I can interject, yeah, yeah, she, was, yeah. she was instrumental in getting Montessori to the Dade County Public Schools. Yes. Yeah, they, they set up Montessori magnet schools throughout the county. And so, yeah. you know, public schools can have Montessori mm -hmm. and, 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 and public schools or, or or independent schools can have a conventional approach or traditional approach. But I do believe that if educators are dedicated, they come to a lot of the same conclusions. You'll find educators in traditional schools, um, conventional schools, non-monastery schools saying, hey, you know, sometimes this multi-age grouping thing really works. Right. Uh, or, oh, wow, you know, when you when you provide a selection of options for children, instead of just you know, just laying out exactly what they're going to do all the time, all day long. Sometimes you find children are more engaged in their education. So I think, I think that they sometimes come to some of similar conclusions by research or observation. But like Mrs. McGee says, Dr. Montessori found out so many of these things and already laid out a program that has all those pieces in yeah, place. Right. Yeah, it's... So it's interesting when folks kind of seem to rediscover yeah, I'm I, yeah. I, I'm all in favor. I've spent the rest of my life helping people to discover the Montessori method when they want to, but that I really want them to do it the right way. And there's a big, sometimes a, a river to cross when you come to that. When somebody says, oh, we're like Montessori. So the parents, some they come and they say, oh, we're like Montessori. You know, we go to so-and-so school, it's like Montessori. They may be like it. I don't know how. They cannot be like it. <laughs> Unless they have the certified teacher, yeah. the prepared environment, which has light and air and beauty, yeah. and the complete set of materials, which is what the child goes through because the materials are didactic. And this is where I call it the habit of success. I have a lot to say about the materials. I don't think you can have a Montessori children's house without a complete set of Montessori materials because they're necessary, they're designed and they're very efficient for the child to be able to follow independently. That's where the independent progress comes from, right? And the yeah. well-trained teacher and the environment. So uh, I, I just feel strongly about it. No, no. I, and I love this. One of the things with this podcast is the kind of 
really dive deep into Montessori at times and get a sense of it. So when, when you say the materials, I found that children love these materials. Montessori tried them all over the world for decades and decades, all, you know, many different people. So they're, they're tested. That's right. Um, That's right. I've, so, seen, I've seen children in Ireland and Japan and Holland. Um, yeah. And Mr. Needles took me to his uh, beautiful school there and, and, uh, and Greece uh, and Mexico. So they work. They work. I've, I've, helped, yeah. I've helped start schools in Haiti and Centro Domingo and then Alabama and yeah. Milton Head, all these places. But I, it, you really need a complete set of materials and the right attitude, too, and yeah. a complete internship. It takes a year of practice, no matter how well educated a person yeah. is, another way. I found this, Miss McGee, and I'm curious because you know, I was trained in AMI, Association of Montessori International. I know there's AMS that's very strong, and there's a few other trainings. I found that some teachers even come out of the best trainings in the world. And sometimes, because they haven't really had that practice with children, they uh -huh. feel lost. You know, when they, when they finally sit down with the child after being, tr quote, trained, they feel lost because they've never really, really practiced it. You know, so how do you, do you, can you give some advice to maybe those, those young teachers coming out of training? They're kind of feeling like, oh my, I thought I knew everything and I know nothing. You know, that type uh, of feeling. Uh, there's no way to replace experiences. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get, I have one story for you. Okay. Okay, go for it. <laughs> but, you know, James and my son and, and, and daughter-in-law, they're AMI, you know, from Perugia, Italy. Yeah. Okay. And AMS Elementary. So um, we all do the best we can, is all yeah. I have to say. But yeah. there, was a, there was a teacher. And she's about four feet, 10 inches tall. And I, I saw her with a group of teachers and, and they were talking. And I said, I came upon them laughing. And I said, oh, tell me the story. Oh, nothing, nothing. I said, no, that's something. I knew there was something. And you know, tell me what's going on. Okay, look at her shins. Look at her legs. And I did. I looked at the teacher's legs and they were all bruised up. I said, Lydia which is her right name, excuse me, but that's, you know, almost 60 years First ago. Name, yeah. I said, Lydia, what happened? She says, mm -hmm. well, Susie Q is kicking me every day when she comes to school. Oh, wow. Well, I'm a very practical person, I think. So uh, my first question is, why don't you move out of her way if you know she's going <laughs> to kick you? But anyway, so I said that. And she said, well, you know how it is. <laughs> and she says, she says, that's not all. And the teacher started to snicker and laugh. She calls, now the little girl has a lisp. She's not yet three years old, right? Mm -hmm. She calls me a stupid ass. She calls her teacher a stupid ass and kicks her in the shins every day. Oh, I said, Lydia, have you told her father? Who was yeah. a very distinguished man who brought her to school every day. Okay. A wonderful gentleman. Oh, no. I said, well, Lydia, you've got to communicate with the parents. You must. And you, usually you communicate with the head of the school on a negative thing, you know, and everybody does it together because parents don't like negative news. But at any rate, I said, you leave it to me. So I saw him that day. And of course, he picked her up about five o'clock because the child even stayed after school. So I told him, I said, I have a funny story to tell you. So I told him the story. And he said, oh, his face turned Beat red, I thought it was going to be blue. He said, that's what I call her when I get mad at her. He called his little baby a stupid ass. So you see, there's a book, and it's called You Are Not the Target. And it's, it's, it says in that book that when people are very angry with you, usually they're simply taking it out on you because you're the first person that they, that they figured that they could attack, and, uh. and somebody hurt them. So they, yeah. you're, vulnerable. you're vulnerable because you're so nice and sweet or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. So if parents could only realize that the children repeat everything they hear at home. <laughs> yeah. But we, we need to share it with them. The absorbent so mind, right? So they understand yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, because, you know, we think about parents, you know, saying something like you stupid ass to a child. Where is that coming from? From their own childhood, right? So it's... And yeah, it's, yeah, we, so we are, remember there's there's a teacher training uh, course on uh, on on the on the tape of the parent inside. Remember, whatever we hear them oh, say, yeah. we do the same thing. We they play do back the tape, right? Uh, yeah. We play back the tape. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So, because you know we don't we don't study to be a parent. Uh huh. Yeah, I know, and that's I mean it's kind of interesting because I I've seen throughout the years, young Montessorians sometimes they they're very harsh on parents because they haven't yet become a parent or that they haven't they don't quite have the empathy for parents so they feel like you should be doing this with your child and the parents like I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, they're at a loss. So how do you balance at your schools over the years? How did you balance the fact that, you know, as Montessorians, we have all this knowledge, we were trained, we have years of experience, whereas the parents come to us usually, and they're brand new, they don't have it. How do you balance that, um, you know, daily? Well, back in the 1960s, we had the most distinguished professors, doctors, and lawyers, and they all met once a week and studied the absorbent mind because it was so exciting and so wonderful and so new. Nowadays, we print a lot of material. We give them a lot of quotes. I think they trust the teacher. The children are doing so well. And we have teacher conferences when they share with them ideas. You know, what does your child do at home? Uh, Please help me to understand this is what's happening here. Um, We have a a uh, semi-parent education course kind of um, visiting in the classroom, which is very important. And and people have told me it's um, when I started that, when I brought parents in to visit during the day, they said, that's not Montessori. They'll disturb the children. That's not the way to do it. Let me tell you, it is the way to do it, right, James? Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? What I discovered because at first with my training with AMI, um, yeah. they they didn't talk about anything like that. And yeah. what I realized though was that when the parent came into the cl- classroom, for the most part, especially if you prepare them and say, "Look, this is not a time for a standing teacher conference. This is definitely not a time to correct or criticize your child. Yeah. Observe your child. Observe and understand that they learn through." success but also through error but the material is self-correcting right so yeah. you know if they make a mistake don't worry because they learn from their mistakes especially if we don't criticize their mistakes and make a mistake something that is wrong right yeah. a mistake or error is simply a simple fact i tried it maybe it worked maybe it didn't it's like science when That's little it. children erase their mistakes a lot of times they say look scientists don't burn their research when they when an experiment fails yeah, it's There's a stepping no stone. Erase yeah. your mistake. You know, if you may now, you know, you can erase something little, but you know, if you do a math problem, it doesn't work out, just write it again. Don't yeah. erase the whole thing. And, and that's, so the way got... children, that's the way the little ch- children learn how to be little scientists and look up information. In the in the old days, we had a set of encyclopedias, how and why. Remember mm-hmm. the world book? Well, now we have the computers and everything. But we, the most important thing is to say to the child, what do you think? And what if? What if we do it this way? What yeah. if we do it that way? And see, that's what's so important about being able to take all the time you want to with a lesson, and you don't have to give them a report card on Friday and give them an A, B, C, or an F. Yeah. So it doesn't Stress. do that. So do you, yeah. you guys, because you mentioned, and I just want to connect all of this, so the, the observation, which... To me, it's not, you know, it's AMI standards, AMS standards, what, what's good for the child and, or for the, in this case, the parent, because if we didn't have the parent in the classroom ever, they really don't know what their child That's is right. capable of. So I, I appreciate that you guys are allowing parents to observe, to see what's happening. So do you, have you experienced that? I've experienced sometimes that teachers, they can be fearful of parents observing because actually because of what you just pointed out that, well, what if something our, goes wrong in the class? Our teachers, you know? are, used to it. Our teachers no. are used to it. I'll give you an example. I was showing yeah, okay. all of our visitors, all of our visitors see classes in action at every yeah. level before we ever ex- think of accepting an application from them. I had a mother once who was a visitor and she looked around, she said, something's wrong with these kids. They should be yelling. Somebody should be angry with somebody. And I said to myself, whoops, she's not for me. Uh-uh. And and she wasn't either. And she didn't enroll. Yeah. <laughs> then, then I had another mother I was showing through once. And she had an eight-year-old daughter and a little three-year-old. And the eight-year-old, believe me, could you believe an eight-year-old was so wise? We were in a preschool and she was observing the children. And this is the truth, one of my favorite quotes. She Mm -hmm. looked at her mother and she said, would you look at those children? 
they think they're playing and they're learning. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, now, and that's, that's the, that's the essence, right? That's she, she hit on the essence of it, you know? Yes, yeah. I think Gabriela, Gar cause I, it was just Gabriela Garcia's Marquez's birthday. And he said, you know, when he was in Montessori school as a child, he said, studying felt like playing. And I, and I think it's go. the case. And I, so that eight year old. Can, so when you feel that way, then how can you resist studying some more or investigating how something happens and becoming yeah. an expert? It's something because you're curious and yeah. children are born. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and you guys said earlier, like, I don't look at it as Montessori school versus public school. I kind of look at it as, okay. you know, Montessori versus what we're, you know, anything that's not aiding the child's life. And what you, what you just said in terms of, you know, if we think about, we don't have to push the child, but I think many of the other approaches to schooling, they have this sense that we have to get them to learn and love when it's a natural process in Montessori, you know? Yeah. So that's no. what it's, that, in most cases, they want to give rewards. And of course, yeah. people do like rewards. I'll tell you the truth. One of the happiest days of my life was mm -hmm. when I won the spelling bee for the city of Detroit, Michigan in the sixth <laughs> grade. <laughs> Could you believe I'm 94 years old? What was the word? Remember. What was the word? Do you remember? I remember the word. <laughs> I'm going to give you, I got to get, I got to find a challenge in world, word real quickly and throw it out at you and see if you can spell it. Was, but was your was was your joy actually in the reward that you were going to receive? Like they said, well, Beverly, you you'll get a brand new car if you win, or was yeah, it the, the accomplishment? Right. It was probably just, the accomplishment. It was, it was a relaxed feeling that that it was a it was it was a reward because I studied hard. I wanted yeah. to win. Yeah. Great grandmother went. I opened the dictionary every night after dinner for a long time, preparing me for that spelling bee. Not yeah. because I'm a and then my my father, he was so surprised, you know. I was so proud to go home and tell him, but I couldn't go to Washington to the Nationals because my mother was dead and I didn't mm -hmm. have anybody to sponsor me, you know, to go along. Uh-huh. Well, but, you know, you know, Beverly, Miss Miss McGee, what what you just said, the two things that come to me. One is in James thinking of this, what you you know, with this accomplishment versus accolades, is that right. Sometimes in Montessori, they say like, oh, it's not a competition. And I think learning isn't a competition, but every now and again, there might be a spelling bee that you do for fun and right. you, you work to, to win the spelling bee. It's not that you want to beat everybody else. And I hate, I, I want to be on, it's just that you work so hard and I enjoyed it. That's right. Yeah. If you enter in with that in mind, it's yeah. like a football game, right? Okay. Yeah. So I, I think it's uh you know, it's funny, Jesse, yeah. Bay County used to have the youngest grade that could compete in the spelling bee was fourth grade. It was fourth mm -hmm. grade and up. And then they dropped it down to like kindergarten, first grade. Wow. And we, the, the lower school students who want to can study and then take the eligibility to test. And then depending upon how they do, we get 25 finalists. And those 25 this year, the second grader was, I think, second place. Yeah. And, and, and a fifth grader was first place. And you can believe that the fifth grader was sweating. <laughs> With his second down his neck at the end. It's amazing. You know, that right? was so exciting. Um, so so but but in the meantime, these are Montessori children or children who had been in Montessori that are now in our fourth and fifth grade, which is what we call middle school prep, non-Montessori. But they all know that they can't all win because only one person can win. Yeah. And, and that's just the reality. Why would you ever compete unless you thought you were number one going to be the winner or number two? You know what? Maybe I will win. Maybe I won't, but I'm going to give it my best. And they yeah. did. And, and when the audience is giving them nothing is harder than being the first person to, to miss in, in the spelling bee. Oh yeah. They get a huge applause they because they had the guts to go up there and try. And then yeah. after that, we have some children, you know, they, they go down and yeah, they have a couple of tears. They, they grab their parents and hug them and they cry because, Hey, darn it. I, I just spelled a harder word and missed on an easier word. What did I yeah. do? That tension, but it's okay. And that's where I think Montessori is about, like we say, telling the parents it's okay if they make a mistake, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of learning in mistakes. There's yeah. a lot of learning in not getting it right. The first time there's more grit developed from not succeeding initially than from succeeding. Yeah. So even though you want to be able to have a path to success and you don't want to demoralize a child, neither 
neither do you want to, for everything to be so perfect that they never make a mistake or never in the short term fail somebody said you never really fail as long as you keep on trying so yeah right. that's yeah. beautiful that's what we yeah, want you guys and i because you because you i'm sure you guys have heard this but i think i think some people in the the normal world out there that don't know monastery they think of it as like oh well everybody gets a ribbon you know it's kind of you know this sense that you know that's not the I, I know, and, uh -huh. and I'm, no, but I'm no. just, I'm raising it because I like Mrs. McGee that you raised the spelling bee because it gave you pride that you put your effort into it. Now, your whole education isn't about competing. That's not the purpose of all, but for this one element, you enjoyed it. It was, it was a, it was a no, moment in your life to enjoy. There, there are certain things in education that one does need to learn. And mm -hmm. one of them is the times tables in math. And <laughs> There's a certain, I mean, the motor memory is the strongest memory of man, Montessori says. But if you want to remember something, you see it, you hear it, you write it, then you remember it better because Automated. you're using all many of the senses, right? So yeah. when I was in 12th grade, I had a teacher who, who told me, you, you go, you, you go take that scholarship exam. Who likes to take an exam? I didn't want to take an exam. <laughs> But she, but I got a good score on her biology test. I think that's the reason for it. And she yeah. loved her student. And yeah. she, she sort of forced me into it. Darned if I didn't get a five-year college scholarship. Yeah. And I, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have gone if she hadn't pushed me. This is a real world out there. There are yeah. certain things that we need to learn. We do need to learn to memorize. However, no. Einstein said it's good to know, but it's important to understand. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a difference in the values and the time and the place for each of those yeah. things. And I think you guys are, you know, basically what we're all getting at here is that there's a context in everything that we do. Cause I know, I think there's Montessorians that are very much like, Oh, you would never memorize. And I was like, well, we all like, if, if I asked you what's four plus four, you'd immediately go eight. It's memorized. You don't have to co compute that now as an adult because we memorize it as children, right? Like you're right. saying with the multiplication tables, um, so I appreciate I appreciate the perspective that you both are bringing, um, which is nuanced. I mean, Montessori isn't like here's the Ten Commandments, and we all just look at the wall and it says this is what you do, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Although there is the Decalogue, you know. I know, is, I know there is the Decalogue. The Decalogue is 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 more about that spiritual aspect of how to approach yeah. the child, observe the child, yeah. and receive the learning, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So there's James, where does the Decalogue because where does the Decalogue come from? I know this is the this is the one with like um never talk ill behind a child, that type of thing. Do you know where what the origin is? I don't know what the origin of that is, and I don't think I it was presented it to me when I was in my training in AMI. I do and no, I don't it wasn't into mine either. So. Uh, yeah. Certainly do you know what the same from? I give it to every student, but I'll declare I don't when I don't remember the source. But when you read it, it oh. sounds just like Maria Montessori. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you read my Montessori, you know it sounds like Maria. Uh, sounds yeah. just like her, so yeah. yeah. But I I mean I raise this because even you're just when we go back to child what what helps a child in their life? And and for you, Miss McGee, we I think I'm sticking on this um this spelling bee because you're 94 years old and what memory comes back to you but this experience as a child. And I think we we all know the importance of childhood when we think about our emotional life, when we think about our own parents or our children. But a lot of parents tend to forget just how spiritual, how deep and how important those experiences are in life. Um, and I just bringing you to the parents out there, can you speak to normal parents and say, what is it about Montessori um, that just is so vital to a child's inner self, their self-development? What, what do you see as being so important? Well, I have to say that I don't know, but my professor kept telling me, and I tell my students, read a Montessori books keep reading what she said because Montessori said within the child is a person he will become she was a firm believer in God so mm -hmm. if within the child he has everything he needs then we're not supposed to disturb the balance of peace and security of that child um, security 
as most psychologists will tell us, is developed in you know in the first few months of life. Uh -huh. A child has to feel that that they are safe in the hands of the parents, and that the parent will always be there for them, even though there there must be some discipline. And some people think that discipline, uh, the disciplining a child will mean that the child won't love them. No, no, no. We are there to guide the child. We have to stop him from what is wrong. And in the absorbent mind, the first three years, they definitely don't know what to do. The second three years, she says, they're beginning to learn to be responsible and understand what to do. So if only parents could understand that they're very important and that they must guide the child and stop what is wrong and love them and give them a second chance, always, 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 not punishment, but give them, give them the opportunity to learn to do it over, to do, to do it right, whatever it is. Would you right? so with with Miss McGee? Would you say with the the stop stop doing what's wrong? So what would stop be an example? Child. Yeah, yeah. So well, what would be an example be, of that? Well, one thing would be in the kitchen touching the stove for heaven's sake. You know, I don't <laughs> see how we all, I don't see how we all live to be 90, uh, 19, much less ninety four, because the children want to touch everything and so forth. Yeah. Uh, Stop doing what is wrong. Stop hitting your sister. Stop throwing the toys. Stop yeah. walking on the sofa. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, this is a very sincere, sort of a quiet thing that I share with you. I had mm -hmm. a little one here at my house and, and the parents said, said, what am I going to do? Because he always wants to walk on the sofa at home and he won't listen to me. He's two years old. I said, does he have a toy? Does he have a little bear or something? You tell you tell him to to set up a you set up a relationship with the bear so that he becomes the boss of the bear, so that he becomes the adult person telling the bear what to do. So he tells the bear, "You can't do so walk on the sofa." You know, you say the floors are for walking, the sofa is for sitting. Now he tells the teddy bear, and he puts a teddy bear instead of punishing him, get him off the sofa and let him. Tell the teddy bear what to do. Say, so you teach a teddy bear, and now we know that you're learning. So you put the power in the hands of the child. I think that's what you need. That's good psychology, but I'll tell you what, that's where we say we don't, what, you, what, what we were saying before. A lot of us don't study to become parents, but once you are a parent, there's nothing keeping you from studying. Uh -huh. and, and a lot of us have to go out there and read and, 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 and think what is true and what makes sense for me. And, you know, there's nothing that keeps you from also observing other parents and how they raise their children and saying, oh, I don't think I want to do that. You know, that looks like it's working. Now, that may not work with my child. But, you know, I think that even when I was raising my own children, I watched other parents and I thought about what I wanted for my children. There were some things that my parents raised me to do or not do or ways that I was raised at home that okay, I said, sure. I'm not going to do that with my child. Yeah. You know, I love my mom and dad to death, but... Uh, I did not have a, a TV in my house. Mm -hmm. I had a video player and I would put on videos if I wanted my child to have them and they would watch them at certain times and not at other times. But I didn't have the news playing every night because when I went home as a little child, I was watching the Vietnam War on TV for dinner every <laughs> night from 1965 until 1975. I'm sorry. I remember when, when, <laughs> when, we, when we finally left Saigon. And, and, oh, and my man. uncle was in that war. And, you know, yeah. I think it. And your yeah. father, his father was a Marine and yeah. he had all the information. So, so I, I understand my dad, uh -huh. my, well, don't be sorry, but I'm just saying that. And so like when the twin towers came down, yeah, I was telling parents, turn off your TV. Don't let your kids see that stuff. That yeah. is prominent. But parents just didn't think like, well, I don't have to let them see this. And today with the media, Parents don't control, uh, you know, their children's access like they could and should. Giving them telephones and and, and unrestricted uh, access to the internet with iPads and stuff, you know. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't control my, how much my child uses mm -hmm. his iPad. Well, my parents wouldn't have messed around; they would have taken the darn thing away. <laughs> my, my dad so, was a tough guy. You know, if my dad yeah. and he and he had a temper, if he thought that it was something not right with my iPad, he would have broke it over his knees, thrown it in the trash, and I wouldn't have had to get another one. Until oh I could, my. Until I could earn Dude. the money to buy it myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. So the little old school part of me that says, I don't want parents breaking iPads yeah. over their knees. I respect my dad for standing up to being responsible 
And if he, if he realized that something wasn't right, he would do something about it. Yeah. So I do want parents to think, look, no, I'm not going to just be a bully in my home. But if, but if, you know, if my kids, if, if I have, you know, if I'm really thinking to myself, this isn't right. My child is spending too much time on social media. Do something about it. Right. Yeah. You know, well, I like, I mean, James, what I like, you started by saying you have to use your judgment. Like, cause you're, you're basically saying, look at what other parents are doing. What do you think? Do you think it's right? Do you think it's good? Look at what Mrs. McGee is saying. Do you think it's right? Do you think it's good? Like you individuals have to make a judgment call. So I, I like the beginning there, you know, and um, permissiveness doesn't work. Yeah. And, I, and yeah. I think, I think the new, the new, this is why I'm kind of with discipline. We all have to experiment because I think the new age Montessori is like, you know, the child can walk on the couch, a child can do somersaults on the couch. And we're like, but wait yeah. a second, we wouldn't do that on the couch. So we have to like, you, you know, we have to figure out a way to actually have real discipline in the house. Um, and it's, again, I think we all can all agree. It's not smacking your child over the head, but at the same time, it's at the same time, it's not letting your child smack you in the head, you know, That's like, right. so. Beverly was used to great psychology with the teddy bear, but a lot of people are not going to come up with that. They're not psychologists, they're yeah. not educators, but if they say to their child, listen, I love you. I'm your mommy or I'm your daddy or I'm your grandma or I'm your, whoever they are. I love you. And here's the thing. In our house, we do not walk on the couch. We walk on the floor. Yeah, that's right. Floor yeah, it's very you simple. Say, you say it firmly. And listen, if they're two or three and you can grab them, lift them off the couch, then you grab them and lift them off the couch. Now, if they can follow instructions, first you say, please come down from the cat. Please join me. Please come on over here. If they can follow your instruction, right, please come over here for a second. You know, children love, uh, I say love, children will be defiant because they're trying to express their own independence and power. So if you say, get off the couch, they might be less inclined than if you just say, hey, can you come on over here for a second? And they come. Then they're they're following your instructions. They're obeying you. And then you talk to them and say, you know, what? I saw you on the couch. We, we sit on the couch. We don't climb on the couch. I know it's fun to climb on the couch. So you can also be empathetic. It can be fun. It can be neat. But Let's climb outside. Let's climb on a tree. Let's climb in the jungle gym. But we're just not going to climb on the couch. Yeah. Well, practical things like that are learned uh, when children go to the Montessori Children's House, too. Um, right, because within the Children's yeah. House, if the teachers approach the discipline in a loving fashion, the children treat the materials clear, right. uh -huh. correctly. They they put them back where they belong, That's and right. they don't do so uh, in a draconian fashion. They just no. say, this yeah. is the way we do it. That's right. That's a, This yeah. is the way we do it. Yeah, I hope you. Thank you very much. What you guys started to raise that in the classroom, because I think, you know, we have we have Montessori who's got a lot of genius to offer us. There's not, I mean, there's not a tremendous amount where she's saying how to discipline your children at home, but in the classroom, as Ms. McGee, you were just raising that we do have grace and courtesy. So there's an there's right. an element that's explicit with these type of lessons in the classroom. So maybe you can comment over your years and seeing. What's the element in Montessori classroom, not the, necessarily the materials, but how we approach the materials, how we approach the people in our environment? Um, okay. how, what, how have you seen that over the years to maybe aid in this um, with children? You know, the grace and courtesy element of the classroom. Well, it's, it's just a, a lesson that has to be practiced. It makes it much easier having the three-year span because... The five-year-old is setting the pattern for the three-year-olds when they come in, you see? And we can always have somebody teach somebody how to pull out their chair and sit down and have lessons in a group and so forth. It, it's much easier when you have younger children who are going to learn from the older children. But like you say, it's hard for the mother who's and dad. They're working and, and they're picking up the child and they're tired and they're going home and I, 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 it wasn't a perfect mommy either. But, well, but, well, no, but, but with great courtesy, for example, there's nothing wrong. I don't think uh, with saying to a child, if they, if we do something for them to say, as a reminder, what do we say? Thank you. You're right. welcome. We have uh -huh. to give the, you're welcome. Right. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. They need it. They need a model of it. Right. Cause if they don't have a model, they wouldn't know to say you're welcome or thank you and so forth. Right. The child says, uh -huh. thank you. And you say, well, thank you too. Thank yeah. them for saying thank you. One of our mm -hmm. alumni has written a book on manners, mm -hmm. and uh, she was in, in school when she did it. She was, and her mother was from Louisiana, and she lives was living in Miami, and her mother brought her back to Louisiana, and she said to her mother, Mom, everybody's so nice here. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it was that good old Southern hospitality. Yes, you know, yes. That, I know. That, and I, that, you see that when you when you travel around, I mean, the country, definitely in America, you see differences among states for sure. Um, and then around the world, we're just you can see what kind of was almost bred in certain states, this sense of kind to your neighbor, saying thank you, opening the door. Um, my wife and I lived in Wichita, Kansas, for a couple of years. And the like we'd see children that would hold the door for us. And then, of course, you know, we were in downtown Miami. Not many children are holding the door for anybody. You know, it's a different it's a different culture at times uh, in certain places. But um, they have to be told. They have to yeah, be no, yes. yeah I, I agree. Yeah, uh, I think we cannot give in to the fact that this is the year of 2023. There's some things that the civilization still enjoys. Mm -hmm. Oh, order yeah, to be yeah. we, need, yeah. we need to be kind to each other and that's what yeah. good manners are all about right? well they say yeah. research has shown that this this newest generation is more tolerant of diversity and difference than any other generation and yeah. that is a big thing and yes, that that's a sign of progress yes it is yeah. you that's know right. that's a sign of progress but in terms of grace and courtesy i love the lessons that it really impressed me when my ami training and probably you too that just to teach the children how to take out a chair and put back in a chair, yeah, how to roll simple, right? it, and then have a lesson where, you know, we could take turns. We could give a lesson with one to one child, but then we could also give a lesson to three children on how to roll a carpet. Who would like yeah. a turn? It's her turn. Then it's her turn. It's her turn. Yeah. And we're all trying to do that with precision. We may not do it with quite such precision when we're on our own, but in that moment, we're trying to develop that attention. And, and how to open a door and say please and thank you and yeah. serve each other. It seems, huh? yeah. I, I think with parents, a lot of the times, like you guys just gave very simple, basic, like how to rug a, roll a, a rug, how to open a door and close a door. But I think as parents, when they don't know how important those specifics are, they think, oh, just tell you, be kind, be good. And it's, it's, be specific. it's abstract. <laughs> it's too abstract for a three-year-old, right? See, this is oh, be specific. How can I be kind? Yeah. You can hold the door for somebody. But this is the idea that we need to realize as a little child is born, we're no, not knowing anything, knowing 10 times nothing, and, and every day experiencing the wonders of the world. Yeah. Life is like magic to these little children when yeah. we treat it kindly. Yes. Yeah. I think you opened with that, Mrs. McGee, too. You opened with that, you know, children come every day and they find this experience, it's this wondrous experience. And I think you're right. Like, we need to get back to that as adults to rem remind ourselves that the world is wonderful. I mean, you live 94 it years. It's incredible, you know, to be living yeah. in today. Do you want to hear something funny? I was yeah. in the hallway today and a fifth grade girl said to me as I was going down the, she was talking to her friend, we we're going down the staircase. Then she turned to me and she said, Mr. McGee, do you like bricks? Grips? Bricks. I said, bricks? <laughs> what? She says, bricks. I said, bricks? You mean like to build houses with? And she says, uh-huh. And I said, uh, I, I think they're kind of neat, but we don't see so many in South Florida. Look at our buildings that are made of concrete block and stucco. When I was up north, lots of houses were made of bricks. She says, my brother has a brick. <laughs> my brother has <laughs> Oh, it was that simple. It was that simple. He keeps it in his room. And, I said, and, and, and there's this the yes. beauty of it, right? Because I said to myself, where would a child see a brick in South Florida? They'd have to probably go to Home Depot. Yes, you know, or yes. maybe their driveway. But a little thing like a brick can be interesting. Yes. It can be yeah. interesting. And know, what, I've, I've never seen more joy than I've seen when children make paper airplanes. The joy of a child just folding a good paper airplane, even up to fourth or fifth grade, they're still excited. Man, I made a good paper airplane. I can fly yeah. it. And then wondering how the airplane... <laughs> yeah there's yeah. this um there's this quote you know em standing one of the biographers of maria montessori there's this quote where he he said uh i think it's chesterfield some writer but the writer said that um a, ch a child of nine or seven he's excited that there's a dragon behind the door a child of four is excited to just open the door <laughs> You know, like the difference. Yeah. And we need yeah. to like get back to the basics as it sounds like, you know, you know, some of what you're what you're getting at here. Because they they find joy in a brick. They find joy I, in a brick. And I know that you understand that. It's such a pleasure to be able to talk with you. Yeah, I mean, likewise. And I'm 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 very grateful that you came on the show. Um, it was 
I was so happy to see you up on stage and sharing your ideas. And that was the first time I saw ever saw you in person. And that's why I was like, Oh, I need to speak with this woman, Miss McGee. She's she sees something else, you know. Um, and then James, <laughs> James was kind enough to be the book be holding my books when I was doing a talk up there. It was it was wonderful. So I appreciate um, you guys both coming on, you know. You are you are amazing. I don't think I've ever seen a better keynote speaker than you. Oh, Jessica. absolutely. Oh. You had everybody in the palm of your hand. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> you were really delivering. I mean, you were using the original Montessori text, underlining, reading yeah. from, you know, from the text, what yeah. you thought was vital and important. And I thought that was fantastic because too often um, folks, they, they, they say, what they want to interpret from it right. instead of just letting it speak for itself. That's yeah, why sure. I want to study again, read it, read for the teachers yeah. to re keep rereading the absorbent mind and all the books that she's written. And I of course am. you know so much. Um, and, and you're asking us what we think I'm honored to share with you. I get pretty excited about it sometimes and go in circles. Um, no, but this is, this so has been, is wonderful. It's a, it's a pleasure having you both on. And I like that we're, we're all kind of ending with, at the end of the day, pick up her books, you know, right. pick up her books right. because I, I meet so many people that are in Montessori and it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't really like her books. I'm like, figure it out, read one of those books, you know, cause there's so there's, they've got a wealth of knowledge and love and spirit and just so much to offer. So, right. so Absolutely. pick up those books. <laughs> you can kind of drop into one it depends but you could yeah. drop into like the 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 absorbent mind or the discovery of the child drop into the middle yes like you just dropped into the middle of a country right and you yeah. don't know drop in and see where the next explore. five paragraphs take you yeah I'm surprised i have yeah. to start from the beginning and go to the end nowadays for us where we have everything it's like given tiktok to us in five second chunks so, you know, explore. There's no commitment. There's nothing wrong. Drop in. Yeah. See what, how is she saying what she's saying? How is she saying what she's saying? And you'll probably find within five paragraphs, you've got something amazing. Just like, and I, and once again, Mrs. McGee said, you know, she believed that Montessori was a, she was a spiritual person and she was a Christian person. A genius. But yeah. I'm sure if you just drop into the middle of the Torah or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita, or or the Bible, New Testament, drop into the middle. Sometimes you'll read it and you go like, I don't know what that was. Drop in somewhere else and you'll be like, wow, that really spoke to me. Yeah. You don't know. Good idea. It's not going to hurt. You're, you're not. It's not going to explode in your hands. It's not going to yeah. fall to people. So and I think we don't. In. And I yeah. And I don't. I don't want to say to people out there like, hey, come on, read her book. It's I'm with you. It's like you know, just go in and explore. We're not saying we're not saying read every her whole corpus, fifteen books. Just drop in, drop in and explore. So I, I'm with you guys. Yeah, and and if you don't want to read her books, drop in and 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 say hi to James and Mrs. Mrs. McGee in, in Miami. You know, you don't drop in. And this Listen is to like Jesse's podcast. You can't yeah. go wrong. Listen to Jesse's podcast. <laughs> um, well, thank that. you again for Miss McGee. Is there anything you want to you know close up with since you know? 94 years old, 60 plus years in Montessori. Is there anything you just want to close with? Because I'm going to leave it to you. I don't want to yap away here. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. It's been a fantastic life. And we just have to remember that the child is yet to be. I, I think I'm still in progress. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's a wonderful like world. It. Yeah. And I want to say thank you to you, Jesse. And thank you to my mom for doing this. And my dad. And thank you to James oh, and his brother sweet. Alexander and my daughter-in-law, Dr. Joyce McGee. She's yeah. behind the scenes, just working all the time, this over 35 yeah. years in what we talk about, the Alexander Montessori School. I'm very happy to have it carried on in the mission. And all the teachers, we have a team. Yeah. I'm telling you, we have a team. I am yeah. so grateful what a for team all our for faculty all these members. Years, over uh -huh. the, you over guys, six thousand you guys people. Have, you guys have built something in, in South Florida. I, I'd say in South Florida, even beyond, I mean, Alexander and then beyond because what Mrs. McGee, what you've helped to develop in South Florida is a community of Montessorians. So when I, when I was down there, just people visit and, and try to copy it. Yeah. You really have, because I've seen, I've met a lot of good people down there in and out of Alexander and then in other Montessori schools there. And you guys have, you create a good environment. 
We're all working for the same mission. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, again, well, thank you guys for coming on. Pleasure being with you. It's a joy. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.